Grand Theft Auto introduced itself to the world in 1997 after having crawled from a vat in a lab where it was chemically engineered to cause heart attacks in parents and politicians the world over. The series immediately made a name for itself. Well, it made a fair few names for itself, depending upon how much it upset everyone in any given week. What tends to get lost in larger discussions of the series, though, is the fact that the games were actually good. People focus on the controversies at worst and how influential it was at best, sort of missing the fact that video games are meant to be fun, and Grand Theft Auto understood that from the very start. It's gaming bliss when things click, and they click with impressive frequency. As such, though we are indeed ranking them from worst to best, be aware that the worst end of this list is rather narrow. Grand Theft Auto certainly isn't everyone's cup of tea, or is that hot coffee, but it's easy to see that each game has an incredible amount of love, creativity, and dedication to quality behind it. Well, most of the games do, don't worry, there are still a few stinkers along the way. Ultimately though, the games are almost all varying degrees of good, so if something that you enjoy ranked relatively low, do know that it's probably not because we hate it. More likely, we just like the other ones a bit more. Grand Theft Auto tends to have a very strong track record when it comes to quality, and I'm sure that will continue in GTA 6, which I look forward to playing when my children are 12 and 14. For context, I currently have no children that I'm aware of. But before we get to the ranking, we have a few ground rules. After all, what's Grand Theft Auto without strict adherence to the rules? This time around, we have decided to count the various expansions to the games, so long as those expansions got standalone releases. Is it fair to compare an expansion to a mainline game? No, of course not, but with only five numbered games, we needed to justify making this list, so deal with it. Secondly, we don't normally count ports, remakes, or collections in these lists. In this case, though, there's one entry that is a port, a remake, and a collection all at once. You already know which one that is, and you already know you'll be hearing about it pretty soon, but we just wanted to mention that we broke our usual rules for a reason, and that reason is that we hate that game and all that it stands for. There are also a few other ports that were different enough to include, and we hate those as well. And finally, we're just going to say Rockstar when talking about the developer. We are very aware that some of these games will have been credited to DMA Design, Tarantula Studio, Take-Two Interactive, or various location-based Rockstar teams, but we're just saying Rockstar. It's easier that way, and it's worth whatever anger it ends up causing you. Alright, let's rank them. I'm Ben, and I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and this is every Grand Theft Auto video game ranked from worst to best. Number 19. Grand Theft Auto – Game Boy Color as an absolute marvel of limited hardware, Grand Theft Auto for the Game Boy Color is excellent. It's never an easy task to take a PC or PlayStation game and make it work on a little Nintendo handheld. Just ask Capcom how that went with Resident Evil. But the GBC GTA port is shockingly faithful to the full experience. The vast majority of the content is there, the cities are just as big, and it runs far better than it has any right to. There are some obvious changes, such as to the interface and the camera, so no, it's not quite a worthy substitute for the full game, but my lord, the fact that they got this working at all is worth celebrating. What's not worth celebrating? Many of the missions have been tweaked for simplicity's sake, which is fine, but they are also buggy to the point that objectives sometimes won't update after you complete them. The limited processor of the Game Boy Color also means that there are far fewer vehicles and pedestrians roaming the map, which sounds fine until you realise that this also means you have far fewer opportunities to rain carnage down around you, arguably robbing the game of its primary appeal. Speaking of which the gore and swearing was removed, robbing it of its secondary appeal as well. The controls are awful, which is to be expected, but the music is awful too, and we all know that the Game Boy Color was fully capable of producing genuine bops, so no forgiveness there. Also, some releases advertised a free pager on the box, but the ROM we played didn't come with one. That's the real crime, and we are the real victims. Interestingly, the Game Boy Color versions of Grand Theft Auto and its sequel would prove to be influential in their own way inspiring 2012's Retro City Rampage, which took a similarly pixelated approach to its own lawless open world. That one kept the gore, though, so pick that up instead. Number 18. Grand Theft Auto 2 Game Boy Color 
Right, Rockstar, you already proved you could do it, and we politely applauded your efforts, but was there any real reason to do this again? Ultimately, no, there was no reason to do it again, but we're still sort of glad that they did, because this version is an improvement. Everything looks better, the music no longer hurts my soul, and there are more vehicles and people around to help the game feel more alive. Well, temporarily alive, you get the idea. Admittedly, this game runs a bit worse. That's the trade-off for everything else being improved, and in our eyes, that trade-off is fair. If you disagree, that's okay, because the point stands that both of these games are notable exclusively for their oddity, and the fact that we are ranking this above its predecessor does not imply that we think anybody should be playing either of them, alright? Both of the original Grand Theft Auto games are available in several other versions, and all of those versions are quite faithful to each other. You will, of course, run into versions that don't run as well, or which have certain scenes censored, or which do or do not include expansions, but basically, if you grab a copy of either game on any system, you'll be getting a more or less complete Grand Theft Auto experience. Any system, of course, other than the Game Boy Color, which didn't need versions of these games, doesn't benefit from having versions of these games, and can only provide lesser imitations of these games. Impressive imitations, certainly, and kudos to everyone who got this stuff working, but we can't recommend that you play either of them. Any time that you do spend with them will be <laughs> wasted. Do you... yeah? You get it? Number 17. Grand Theft Auto Advance Game Boy Advance After an underwhelming handheld port of the first game and an underwhelming handheld port of the second game, certainly an underwhelming handheld port of the third game will make everybody happy. Right? Right? Well, don't worry. Grand Theft Auto Advance indeed began life as a GBA port of Grand Theft Auto 3. At some point in development, though, somebody said, but wait, aren't these ports terrible? Then everybody else sort of shrugged. They decided to make a completely new game instead, and that was absolutely the right idea. It's still bad, though. Obviously, no matter what, a port of Grand Theft Auto 3 would have been reworked substantially out of sheer necessity. There's no way we'd have gotten a full 3D open world on a system like this. This, and we can't blame them for refining the 2D top-down approach of the previous games instead. It does include some features of the 3D games, however, such as vehicle-specific side missions when driving police cars or taxi cabs. The camera also zooms out while driving quickly, which is something that the GBC games couldn't provide. The controls aren't great, but considering the few buttons on the GBA, we can't have asked for much more. The story takes place in Liberty City, about a year prior to the events of Grand Theft Auto 3. The plot is that you are Mike, a man who, well, he is a man, I can say that much, and in my experience, he commits crimes, but not as often as he gets lost trying to navigate his own city. It doesn't have much of a story, no, but it does at least come closer to the graphic violence of the main games, and it fills in a little bit of the backstory for some of the GTA 3 characters, such as 8-Ball, which is... Good? Look, I'm trying not to come off as too negative, as it really is impressive that these games run at all on such weak handhelds, but... Well, they're just not very good. We've played far worse, but we've also played far better, for this list especially. Number 16. Grand Theft Auto The Trilogy The Definitive Edition PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Switch, Xbox One, Xbox Series, and PC Good idea! Remastering three beloved games in one of the world's biggest franchises! Bad idea! Turning the project over to the old woman who restored the Ece Omo. A repackaging like this should have been an easy bullseye. Instead, Rockstar managed to hit themselves in both eyes with the dart and then accidentally swallow and choke on it. The package contains new versions of Grand Theft Auto 3, Vice City, and San Andreas. They're largely remastered ports, but there's a bit of remake about them as well, with updated HUDs, navigation, and other features to bring them more in line with modern expectations. Sadly, the modern expectation that it lives up to best is the one that suggests that games will be launched as buggy, unstable messes, and everybody who paid full price at launch gets to sit around hoping that the game will eventually be patched. Everything about this package screamed catastrophe from the start, right down to Rockstar removing previous versions of the games from sale. That wouldn't have been so bad if the new versions were, you know, not markedly worse than the ones they were replacing. Many of the so-called improvements actually hampered our enjoyment, including weather effects that made it impossible to see, increased draw distances revealing just how small the maps really are, and an AI upscaling process that incorrectly rendered words and images on textures across all three games. The thing with AI upscaling, in case you weren't aware, is that the software does most of the work, but a human being still has to actually check through to make sure it was done properly. This is because 
cannot stress this enough, machines do not have human brains. Somehow Rockstar forgot this and it leads to everything looking disappointingly amateurish, which is something these games never looked like before. A set of three competent remasters could well have reminded us all that the games weren't as great as we remembered them being. That, of course, was always a possibility. What the definitive editions did, though, was make them actively worse, more glitchy, less fun, and far less interesting to revisit. It's impressive, really. Number 15. Grand Theft Auto London 1961. PC. Yo dog, I heard you like expansion packs, so we put an expansion pack in your expansion pack so you can expand your expansion pack with an expanded expansion pack. Relevant meme. This one is a slight stretch to include, but at the same time it didn't feel right to leave it out. Grand Theft Auto London 1961 was free, but it did require players to own both the base game and Grand Theft Auto London 1969, so it feels more like a sort of full-length demo. It wasn't one, as you already needed both of the games it might have inspired you to buy, but that's exactly what it feels like it should have been. It's very brief and relies heavily on the gameplay and assets of the previous London expansion. Yes, the London 1969 expansion came out before the London 1961 expansion, making this the first time that Grand Theft Auto would dabble in direct prequels, and it would be far from the last. It's interesting that a series that is very content with providing self-contained stories in each games would also bother connecting narrative dots that don't need to be connected. And that's not a complaint, but it's interesting how quickly and repeatedly the series went to that well. In fact, London 1961 could be considered a prequel to the entire series as it takes place the earliest chronologically. At least, so far. I hold out hope for a Grand Theft Auto set in 1959, starring those singing miscreants from Greece, and I don't know why Rockstar doesn't reply to my emails. Unlike London 1969, London 1961 never made it to consoles, but fans aren't really missing out on much. It's another brief dip into what most of us already experienced with London 1969, which doesn't make it bad, but which does make it inessential. There are a few nice touches, though. There's more multiplayer content, including a unique map based on Manchester. I've been to Manchester, but I've never viewed it from a top-down perspective, so I can't vouch for its accuracy. I just wish they'd have added Newcastle. It's a nice place, and I'd love to demonstrate my love for it with a vehicle-based crime spree. Ah, never mind. Number 14. Grand Theft Auto London 1969. PlayStation and PC. In the days before 3D Worlds, it must have been quite easy to rework your game to take place in a new city. Look, we're in London now! Not that you can tell, because you're only looking at tarmac and the tops of buildings, but I swear this game takes place in a whole other country! In fairness to Grand Theft Auto London 1969, the game does indeed spice things up with different vehicles and imagery, and they even remember to program the cars to drive on the correct side of the road. Still, it's interesting how quickly Rockstar used to be able to turn one city into another. Today, that would take them... Uh, let's see. Nine years and counting. The gameplay is very similar to the original Grand Theft Auto, which is to be expected. This was released as an expansion pack on both the PC and the PlayStation, meaning that it required the original game to run. If you liked that game, this was just a less expensive way to get more of it. Of course, here in the UK, we got a far superior Grand Theft Auto London Special Edition on the PlayStation. It featured swathes of upgrades and improvements, such as the ability to play the game without owning the original Grand Theft Auto. Oh, that was it. Really stretching the special edition label there. The game is notable for being the first time the series has taken place in a real-world location. Well, unless you count Earth. But yeah, you get the idea. Overall, though, it doesn't do all that much with its real-world location. It's a repainted Grand Theft Auto with some retro British imagery. That's all it tried to be, of course, but that does mean that it's not particularly worth seeking out on its own merits. I think we can all agree, at the very least, that the voice acting in the cutscenes is accurate, authentic, and lovingly realised. Either that or it's a joke. Sweet Jesus, I hope that it's a joke. Number 13. Grand Theft Auto 2. PlayStation and PC. We might be in for a little bit of confusion here, as the PC version is technically the original, and the PlayStation version is the port, and a lesser one, but the PlayStation port released a few days earlier, and a Dreamcast port, which we aren't counting here because it released the following year rather than within the original release window, is more faithful to the PC game so that one should probably count as the direct port. Still, we're lumping the PlayStation version in here because it's not quite different enough to warrant a separate discussion that treads most of the same ground. 
The main differences between it and the PC version come down to content tweaks due to the PlayStation not being quite powerful enough to handle the same number of sprites. It's also missing some of the map and around half of the collectible tokens. I could keep listing minor differences like this, but I think we'd all end up falling asleep together and I don't know you that well, that'd be weird. The game takes place in Anywhere City, which gives you some idea of just how much thought went into the story. Like its predecessor, Grand Theft Auto 2 is more about reveling in moment-to-moment -moment carnage than it is about story or characterization. This game does add an interesting wrinkle, though. Each area of the city has several warring gangs. As you build up your reputation with one, the others will turn on you, and you'll have to balance your illegal activities accordingly. Otherwise, it's a similar experience to the first game. Whereas that first game could get away with some very rough edges on account of its novelty, however, the second game repeats many of the same problems without much of an attempt to improve anything. It's still unclear how to get to your destination much of the time, it's still a repetitive city full of areas that are indistinguishable from one another, and its difficulty is still due to design problems rather than actual challenge. If you prefer this one, we don't blame you. To us, however, it feels like the odd game out. It wasn't as influential or important as its predecessor, and nothing that it added made the game more fun. Number 12. Grand Theft Auto PC Fallout, GoldenEye, Final Fantasy VII, Symphony of the Night, Parappa the Rapper, Oddworld, Mario Kart 64, Turok Dinosaur Hunter, Age of Empires, probably also some other things. 1997 was not only a wash in great games, it was a wash in some of the most important and influential games in the history of the medium. There was no more appropriate time for Grand Theft Auto to turn up then. It was every bit as influential, but also far more likely to shove you down, steal your wallet, and then run you over with your own car. Grand Theft Auto hit the scene like an unwelcome relative, reveling in its own instant controversy and bad taste. Those things would only be cranked up by its sequels, but the first game was a raunchy word-of-mouth sensation that offered a riveting glimpse into a very chaotic gaming future. What's more, the entire thing was a fluke. Development began on Race and Chase, a game in which players could complete missions on either side of the law in an open-world environment. However, an unexpected issue with the police AI meant that the cops behaved, well, as overenthusiastic and quick to violence as actual police. <laughs> Whoops. Rockstar realized the real fun would be in getting the police to pursue you, and then either outwitting or overpowering them. The design then shifted entirely to the world of crime, and that's where we find ourselves today. If Grand Theft Auto 1 seems tame in hindsight, it's only because of how far the series has come and how deeply depraved it has gotten. The casual nature of the violence here and the satisfying bursting of bodies into blood puddles made for a genuinely shocking experience at the time. The game was originally released for the PC, but many of you will remember the PlayStation port. It wasn't identical, but we aren't ranking it separately because it's close enough. Aside from some graphical downgrades, the removal of trains, and a couple of missing missions, it was a fairly faithful version of the original. If you played it in 1997, wherever you played it, the odds are good that you still remember it fondly. There's no denying, though, how much better things got from there. Number 11. Grand Theft Auto 3 PlayStation 2. Grand Theft Auto always courted controversy, but bringing the violence into 3D made it more realistic, even if realistic now seems like a rather silly way to describe any footage of this game. As such, much ink was spilled about the degenerate antics you could get up to in Grand Theft Auto 3, from mistreating sex workers to slaughtering police officers. But in a way, it's admirable that Rockstar didn't pull its punches when translating the blood-drenched insanity of the earlier games or soften it for the sake of wider appeal. Instead, the developer doubled down, tripled down, and we're fairly sure quadrupled down as well, making this the most unhinged experience the series had offered yet. And in many ways, things were just getting started. 
Of course, the developers weren't entirely heartless. Very late in development, the September the 11th terrorist attacks took place, and Rockstar understood that fiery chaos in a city based on New York might hit a bit too close to home for many people. They quickly retooled elements of the game and released this modified version in October. Much of the reason they were able to implement those changes so quickly, of course, is the fact that there's not all that much story in GTA 3. You are a silent protagonist, and nearly all of the plot developments boil down to somebody telling you to commit a crime. Granted, we could be very reductive and say that the entire series boils down to that, but here you can really feel how direct it is. The characters are voiced very well, and some of the jokes are funny enough, but there's little actual meat to the game. Now that's fine if you're only looking to wreak havoc, but actually playing the game as intended is when all of its flaws are revealed. From the controls, to the combat, to the lack of variety, to the unnecessary difficulty in even navigating the city. Grand Theft Auto 3 seems to do everything in its power to prevent you from playing it properly. GTA 3 laid the groundwork for the 3D games to come, and that in itself is notable, but going back to it, well, it's very easy to focus on what just about every later game did better. Number 10. Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories – PlayStation Portable the first fully 3D handheld game in the series, there's a lot to like about Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories. It also handles its prequel status much more interestingly than Grand Theft Auto Advance did. You would see familiar locations and a few familiar faces in that game, but Liberty City Stories goes all the way with it, showing us earlier incarnations of more characters and drawing attention to the many ways the city has changed over the years. Areas that are under construction here are fully built built by the time of Grand Theft Auto 3, and things that get destroyed in the course of this game's events are missing by the time of that game. It's superficial for the most part, yes, but it's nice they bothered to give us a different version of the city rather than a condensed retread. You are Tony Cipriani, returning to Liberty City after four years of exile and looking quite svelte before his three-year diet of straight pasta. What follows is a story of shifting allegiances, double crosses, assassinations, and unchecked carnage. Goodness gracious, I'm beginning to think the Mafia life might not be for me. One truly impressive feature for a PSP game was the ability to import custom music. Granted, it required faffing about with external software and fighting with the game to recognize your music as legitimate tracks that you definitely did not download from LimeWire, infesting your parents' computer with spyware in the process, but it was a very welcome touch. The game received a PlayStation 2 port the following year, but that introduced glitches of its own and had a significant slowdown and lag issues. Those are things that can be overlooked on a handheld simply because of its lack of processing power, but when the PS2 had actual full GTA games of its own and ran them just fine, the performance of Liberty City Stories there is appalling, to be honest, and I don't even get to import my MP3 of Ocean Man. Oh, unforgivable. Number 9. Grand Theft Auto Vice City Stories 2006 – PlayStation Portable Liberty City Stories was, by quite a wide margin, the best-selling game on the PlayStation Portable. The second best? Vice City Stories. The third best? A game that's irrelevant to the subject of this list, so stop trying to distract me! Vic Vance is our protagonist for this one, and since it's another prequel, the guy is guaranteed to live through the events of the game. Oh, that's a nice change of pace, eh Vic? Vice City Stories ties its narrative a little bit better into the main game's events than Liberty City Stories did, at least as far as we're concerned, but both games reimagine familiar places and characters in intriguing ways. Where Vice City Stories really outperforms Liberty City Stories, though, is in its performance. The game runs much better, looks better, and feels better to play. Liberty City Stories had a better difficulty curve overall, though, and the pair of them offer both quick bursts of great fun and the ability to plough through missions at length, so if you would rank Liberty City Stories higher, I really couldn't blame you. 
Actually, yes I could, because Vice City Stories is the one with a cameo by Phil Collins, and you can plop down 6,000 GTA Fun bucks to see him in concert. And by that I mean you can watch some polygons on your PSP wiggle around while you listen to In The Air tonight. If only the game had been on the Vita instead, Phil could have sang Invisible Touch Screen. <laughs> ah yes, it's just another day in paradise here at Triple Jump Towers with our Phil Collins jokes. Vice City Stories is a genuinely good game, and it's one that gets unfairly overlooked, we feel. The empire building feature even gives players a reason to engage more deeply with the side content, as you're able to oust rival gangs from their sources of income and take them over for yourself. Of course, other criminals can try to oust you as well, until you take over all of the available businesses in the city. It's like Monopoly, but with brothels and smuggling. Actually, the original UK and US monopolies are based on London and Atlantic City, aren't they? Yeah, in that case, it's it's just Monopoly. Number 8. Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars DS At last, a GTA game on a Nintendo handheld that feels like a GTA game. It's less deep than the full 3D outing, certainly, but it's an absolutely worthy successor to the 2D ones. You are Huang Li, and you've arrived in Liberty City just in time to be shot in the head and dumped in the sea. Oh, that was a quick game, wasn't it? No, of course, you survive, and it's your job to work out what's going on, help decide the outcome of a massive turf war, and ignore all of that, because this is GTA, and you have an entire city to explore and visit death upon. Well, not quite an entire city, but an impressive amount of one, considering it's on the same console that gave us Nintendogs. For everything the game does right, though, there's a drawback. The lock-on is a nice feature, but isn't always smart enough to target your actual enemy. The rotating camera is a great addition, but still doesn't show enough of the environment to make fast driving satisfying. And the number of vehicles and weapons is impressive, but it still feels limited. Chinatown Wars is worth playing, certainly, but it probably won't become your new favourite in the series. Later the same year, the game was ported to the PSP. Conventional wisdom is that this was due to low sales on the DS, but even the earliest sales reports wouldn't have been available until April 2009, and this was on the PSP by October. Six months would have represented a rather incredible turnaround time between not even considering a PSP port and now you can buy this PSP port, especially considering they had to rebuild a dual-screen game for a single-screen system. Them. No, more likely they'd already had a port in mind, but that doesn't make for an interesting story, does it? And as we all know, the gaming websites need stories, even if they can't decide what the story actually is. The PSP version adds new missions and replaces some touchscreen minigames with QTEs. Now, you might have a strong preference there, but if I'm to choose between one evil and another, then I prefer not to choose at all. Number 7. Grand Theft Auto 4 The Lost and the Damned Xbox 360 As we've seen, Grand Theft Auto loves its prequels. For a pair of GTA 4 standalone expansions, however, Rockstar went a different route. Separate stories that overlap with the events of the main game. There are some who call those sidequels. Don't be one of those people, because that word is awful. It's difficult to say as well. Let's all agree never to use sidequel again, okay? The first of these two expansions was the Lost and Damned, which focuses on Johnny Klebitz, a minor character from the main game. The action centers around the Lost Motorcycle Club, a group of, well, let's just say quite awful people and leave it at that. Johnny grapples with the direction of the Lost, the demands of his personal life, and a possibility of getting out and doing better for himself. It's a decent story, and it has a unique feel when compared to the main game, thanks to its focus on biker culture and iconography. You even need your motorcycle for missions, which helps this game feel different and more focused in that regard. Impressively, The Lost and the Damned gives you access to the entire map from GTA 4. That doesn't mean you get the same content, each game has very different missions and objectives of course, but the sheer fact that Rockstar gave you free roam of the city feels generous. It also adds new mini-games to enjoy, with air hockey being our personal favourite, but only because we are really bad at cards. Oh, and instead of shooting pigeons, you shoot seagulls! See? Totally different game. Right, okay, it's not. The Lost and Damned is, at its core, exactly the same game with a different story layered over it, but that's far from a bad thing. The overlap in the narratives is handled well, and Liberty City is still great fun to rampage 
stitched through. This is just a very similar, smaller helping. It wasn't a proper sequel, but it was very clearly not marketed as one. As a way of killing time before GTA 5, it was quite welcome. In fact, we wish we had something similar right about now. Number 6. Grand Theft Auto – The Ballad of Gay Tony Xbox 360 as with The Lost and the Damned, The Ballad of Gay Tony put us in control of a minor character from Grand Theft Auto 4, this time Luis Lopez, whose story here overlaps both that of the main game and its predecessor. Indeed, both of these expansions received praise for their writing, and rightly so. They feel like natural extensions of the first game that also function just fine as standalone experiences. This one explores Luis's relationship with Tony Prince, who our protagonist sees not only as an employer and mentor, but as a father figure too. It's their relationship that forms the core idea identity of this game, and it's a great one. You can still get up to all manner of mischief and mayhem around the city, and by this point you'll know the city quite well, but Luis trying to balance the demands of his career and life, all while trying to keep Tony's empire afloat just a little longer, is compelling. The central characters are both well-written and excellently acted, and that alone elevates the Ballad of Gay Tony above just being another excuse to wreck up Liberty City. And speaking of Liberty City, the Ballad of Gay Tony received some improvements to its graphics, physics, and performance. Those things don't completely revolutionise the GTA. GTA 4 experience, but they do make this game at least feel like more than just another trek through the same environment. The Lost and Damned had a unique identity thanks to its dabbling with biker culture, and sure enough, club culture plays a similar role here as well. We're not really a part of either culture, but we do admit that we'd probably rather spend a night on the dance floor than getting our teeth kicked out at a biker bar, so maybe that's why we're comfortable ranking this one higher. So did the overlapping stories of Luis, Johnny and Nico go on to shape the approach that Grand Theft Auto 5 would take? I don't know. I don't make these games. I just commit heinous acts in them and shoot lots and lots of birds. Number 5. Grand Theft Auto Online, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360. Boy, there's really no way to rank this one properly, is there? Grand Theft Auto Online is an experience that continues to evolve significantly, and not taking that evolution into account is sort of missing the point of the game. It's not an experience that was later enhanced, in other words, it's an experience that has been changing since day one, and will continue to change so often that anything I say in this entry will be well out of date by the time many people hear it. In fact, since I've started recording this voiceover, the game has probably changed enough that I'm no longer even talking about the same thing. Grand Theft Auto Online was originally an optional online component of Grand Theft Auto V, but in 2022 it got a standalone release, meaning that a nine-year-old game only got a standalone release recently. Like I said, it's a complicated situation and a difficult ranking. So let's speak generally. Grand Theft Auto Online was and is an opportunity for you, your closest friends, and lots of unfortunate strangers to wander a massive map and make each other miserable. And I mean that in a good way. The appeal of Grand Theft Auto has always been deeply rooted in causing chaos. Chaos is fun, it's why we hired Ashton. And causing chaos with actual people, whether you know them or not, is even more fun. It's one thing to steal a plane and crash it into a digital pedestrian. It's another thing entirely to crash it into a digital pedestrian controlled by another human who doesn't realise just how difficult you're about to make his plans for the evening. Grand Theft Auto Online has been updated consistently since release, with new types of missions, a team-based heist mechanic, casinos, new areas of the map, and honestly, more things than we could possibly cover here. Whenever you last played the game, the odds are good that you could pop in again and enjoy entirely new content for days on end. Rockstar has provided even more support for this game than they did for Red Dead Online. Not that that would be difficult. I'm not sure Rockstar remembers they made Red Dead Online. Number 4. Grand Theft Auto Vice City PlayStation 2 after Grand Theft Auto 3 took the action into the glorious third dimension, Vice City proved not only that the series could keep getting better, but that it could see regular releases as well, assuring fans that they should never have to wait more than a few years between proper instalments. <laughs> that was certainly fun while it lasted, wasn't it? Uh. Vice City pulls more than a little inspiration from 1983's Scarface, and by that I mean Vice City adapts 1983's Scarface without having to pay anyone. But what of the game itself? Well, it's darn good, and we're glad Rockstar allowed it to be a full-length experience, rather than the optional expansion pack from GTA 3 it was originally planned to be. Career criminal Tommy Vassetti gets out of prison and decides to put his illegal dealings behind him, opting instead for a life of quiet comfort in a fictionalised version of Miami. Joking, of course, this is Grand Theft Auto, baby. Tommy drives right back into dealing drugs, ends up surviving an attempt on his life, and turns what could have been a simple quest for revenge into a dedicated attempt to conquer the entire city. 
Say what you will about Tommy, but when he sets his goals, he follows through. GTA 3 was impressively dense for a PS2 game, but Vice City outdoes it several times over. It seems to be a bit glitchier than GTA 3 was, but glitchy by 2002 standards is almost rock solid by 2022 standards. So hey, we'll take it. Most of the problems in Vice City were inherited from GTA 3, such as its controls, its unclear navigation, and its lack of cover or other options during gunplay. But it adds so much, such as the ability to buy up businesses and complete dedicated missions for them to build your empire, that we really can't complain about some some unfortunate quirks. Vice City was basically Grand Theft Auto 3, but with a better city, better missions, better characters, a better story, better acting, better violence, and most importantly, a better showcase of Hawaiian shirts. It might look rough by today's standards, but it's also still a highlight of the series. Number 3. Grand Theft Auto 5 PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 Upon release, Grand Theft Auto 5 was lavished with praise, and just looking at it, it's easy to see why. The game was and remains gorgeous, the map is huge, and it's packed with things to do. Superficially, it seems to check all of the right boxes. However, as the years have passed, many players and critics have soured on the game, its uneven writing, the fact that its story loses steam as it progresses, and a shallow that the previous smaller games didn't seem to suffer from. Now, let's be clear, it's perfectly fine to reassess games. Something we enjoyed as kids may not hold up now, and that's okay. In this case, it might be something we enjoyed in 2013, though, rather than as kids. The fact we enjoyed it then does not mean we can't acknowledge its flaws today. Having said that, though, we do think that the GTA 5 is by far the worst one crowd is probably exaggerating a bit. It's a good game. It's not the best one, but there's a lot to enjoy here, and it's not Grand Theft Auto 5's fault that Rockstar haven't given us anything to keep us from getting bored with it since then. There are two main major benefits that Grand Theft Auto 5 has going for it. Firstly, there's the map, which is hugely impressive and impressively huge. Taking just a few minutes to explore, and maybe smash up some pedestrians and property along the way, reveals just how varied and well-designed the environment is. Secondly, there's the trio of protagonists. Michael, Franklin, and Trevor. The writing isn't consistently sharp, but the performances certainly are. These feel like distinct and identifiable characters with serious differences in their hopes, worries, and motivations. That's notable, as is the fact that you can switch between them at almost any time with very little delay, no matter where they are on the map. You'll even switch between them during the same mission at times, particularly during the heists, which are by far the highlight of the entire game, and add a real element of tension and strategy to the chaos. It's flawed, certainly, but we still think it deserves a spot in the top three, alongside video game royalty such as number two, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, PlayStation 2. Are you disappointed this wasn't tied with something else for number 9? We might have had to talk about two games in one entry as a result, making it a uh, number 9 large. I'm certainly disappointed about that, but hey, it's not my fault the game deserves better. We're talking about the non-remastered version of the game deserving better, of course. In fact, it can be argued that San Andreas ended up being more influential to the series than Grand Theft Auto 3 did. The fact that San Andreas actually has a full fleshed out narrative means that it provides a preview of an approach that would not only pay dividends in this franchise, but in Rockstar's other games, most notably Red Dead Redemption. Vice City certainly had a memorable protagonist, but San Andreas actually has storytelling and characterization. Whether or not that's important to you is, well, up to you, but that elevates it significantly in our eyes. Vice City also had a nice roster of big-name acting talent, but San Andreas mops the floor with them, including the likes of David Cross, Peter Fonda, Ice-T, Charlie Murphy, and of course, Samuel L. Jackson, whose corrupt Officer Tenpenny character has to be the greatest villain in the history of the series. His presence is downright arresting. Also, James Woods is there. It's less easy to get excited about James Woods nowadays, but hooray nonetheless. 
The game still, of course, shares many of the same issues as its two mainline predecessors. Long missions that need to be restarted from scratch when something goes wrong is probably the biggest problem, but it's really not so bad. All you have to do is follow the damn train, CJ. And San Andreas does attempt to iron out a few of the long-standing wrinkles, such as by adding the ability to set custom waypoints. Now that's an achievement with a map this big on a system like the PS2. There are even minor RPG elements that let you increase your skills. That's not really necessary, and the effect sometimes seems negligible, but it's a nice impulse. Even if you just play these games for the sake of causing random trouble, the story's power struggle between the various gangs makes all of your actions feel a bit more meaningful. The theme of the game informs how we perceive the action, making CJ feel more like a man pushing back against the world around him than a video game character shooting other video game characters. And that is refreshing to see. And in our eyes, GTA San Andreas was only outdone the once. Then, Number 1. Grand Theft Auto 4, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360 There were quite a few games in the series released between Grand Theft Auto 3 and Grand Theft Auto 4, but the desire for a new, numbered game was still enormous. How enormous? 3.6 million units sold on day one, 8.5 million units sold in a month, more than 25 million units in lifetime sales. That enormous. Grand Theft Auto 4 was a sensation, and if you were around in 2008, you no doubt remember the enormous marketing push behind the game. If you were not around in 2008, well, you probably shouldn't have watched a video about these games, really. Sorry about that. You are Nico Bellic, a firm contender for the most iconic protagonist in the series. Your cousin Roman, fan of bowling, is, according to him, living the American dream in Liberty City. That's debatable, but he still gives Nico a place to crash when he emigrates from Yugoslavia to seek some totally healthy revenge. You help Roman out of his troubles as you help yourself right into fresh new troubles of your own. It's an appropriately dark story that would probably tip into unbearable cynicism if it weren't for how fun it actually is. It takes everything that made the previous 3D games great and amplifies it all masterfully. So much so that it's tough to play GTA 4 and not come away impressed by just how much it took a winning formula and moved it further. Setting the action again in Liberty City really helps to show how much more Rockstar was able to achieve here. There's more traffic on the streets, more detail on each of the buildings, more characters to encounter, more mission variety, fewer loading screens, cleaner action. Everything just feels right. And once you play GTA 4 with its refinements and additions, it's tough to go back to the earlier games. With a series like this one, no one installment can make everybody happy. Features come and go without any one game including everything that fans have loved. If you preferred the games in which you could purchase more properties or which had more options for customization, you might feel like GTA 4 takes a step back, and you're totally entitled to feel that way. But when everything else is so strong, when just about every element of the game's design, tone, story, and mechanics come together to provide an experience that is this compelling and memorable, well, it's not really worth focusing on what's missing. Just focus on what's here. When you do, it's tough to argue that the series ever got better. 